Uh, sounds good. So let me uh, with uh, like a quick introduction. So uh, yeah, so welcome everyone to the seminar. So it's uh, it's great to have uh, Chinmay Hegde. So he is uh, he's a faculty member at uh, NYU Tandon. He was at Iowa State before this, and then before that he was a postdoc at MIT. And uh, yeah, so I've actually known Chinmay. I mean, I, I knew him about twenty years over 20 years ago and then kind of we lost touch for a long time and then I met him again at one of these uh, conferences so two three years ago and I realized that he's working on very cool stuff so so yeah so he's been uh, I think he is uh, I mean his research has kind of evolved over time so he's been doing a lot of work on information theory and communication signal processing and now more of machine learning so on. So I'm very excited about what he's going to talk about. He's into security, apparently. So, uh, so yeah. So Chinmay, please go ahead. Yeah. yeah thanks, Alit, and really nice to meet you again. We have crossed paths many times, uh, and yeah. I, uh, I really wish I would be uh, meeting you in person, but you know, pandemic. Uh, so yeah. Uh, next time, I hope. Yeah, um, next idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, just uh, by way of introduction, and I already mentioned this, but my work is kind of all over the place. Um, currently, my lab works on a few different things, um, deep learning theory, um, robustness of uh, deep networks, um, application to inverse problems, especially imaging. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Can you see my mouse? Maybe I can use that as a pointer. pointer. Uh, Could see it when it was on your slide, but oh, not right I now. Okay, that's don't it's fine. Don't worry. Uh, I'll just talk over things, um, and then um, yeah, and then I also work in a um, bunch of different application areas, including uh, material science and uh, cybersecurity. Uh, so I was struggling with what I should really talk about, and uh, you know, normally I would probably talk about some theory style work, but um, I don't know. I, I, don't, I mean, it's Friday. Uh, you know. Um, I, I don't think people want to hear uh, deep math stuff right now. So I thought I'll have a more applied kind of talk. So I'll, I'll actually talk about um, um, some of the latest work I've been doing, which is uh, on um, application of machine learning to the intersection of machine learning and cyber security. And uh, before I proceed, I just want to acknowledge a bunch of very uh, awesome collaborators and co-authors. Uh, really, all I'm going to talk about today is due to the hard work of my excellent uh, PhD student, uh, Daniel Cho, who's about to graduate. Uh, this is also a um, you know, collaboration with many other people at NYU and my former colleagues at Iowa State. So really what I'm going to be talking about is in the intersection of uh, deep neural networks and secure inference. But before I go into the details, I just want to um, motivate the area and I share with you why I got interested in this. So, you know, uh, it's all about data privacy, right? So uh, it's become a big deal. It's always been around, but uh, you know, the visibility of the privacy um, problem uh, has become higher and higher in the recent few years. Um, and we, have, we hear about cases against uh, the major tech companies like Google and YouTube and so on. And you know, if you violate privacy uh, of users, you know you get fined you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. A um, couple of years ago, uh, the EU passed a sweeping set of laws uh, called the GDPR, uh, the Data Protection Regulation. And in fact, one of, in one of their uh, texts, they actually say that it should be a human right. <laughs> right? So it's, uh, it's something that uh, you know is increasingly becoming important uh, to, to society as, as, uh, as a whole. And you know, as uh, folks who do data science and machine learning, uh, we should also be very carefully thinking about these things. Um, it's actually interesting how fundamental this is. Um, so imagine, for example, you know, like an everyday task. Right? Like all of us have cell phones, and we take pictures of our cell phone uh, right? uh, on our cell phones, maybe of our kids. or of people and uh, you know Google you know and I'm sure I, I use a Google, I use an Android but I'm sure Apple has the same thing. You know, it, it does an excellent job of tagging who is there in the photograph. Right? Like there's this you know, it, it, you know you take a picture and immediately Google knows and can classify who is. Right? 
But if you think about how, what's happening here, right? Like it's really, there are really, really two things you can do, right? So one, um, I take a picture and I send it to Google and Google classifies that picture. That's you know, um, facial recognition on that picture. But I, I may not want to do that because of privacy, right? I don't want to share my the picture of my child with Google. Right? I don't want to send that to Google. Alternately, uh, you know, it's the opposite, right? So Google sends me their model on my device, right? If I don't want to share my data, then the other alternative is I get the model from Google and uh, you know run the model on my picture, and then that's fine, some kind of classification. So really, there are only two options, okay? And neither option is desirable, right? So uh, you know, in terms of privacy, I don't want to share my data with say anybody, right? But then you know, Google's uh, Facial recognition system has been trained for oh, you know using hundreds of millions of dollars. Right? They may not want to share their model with me, right? So it's really this uh, cash twenty two. Right? How, so how do we resolve this? Right? So really, I mean, in terms of uh, concrete machine learning problem, right? Let's say that I let's say that there is a function which you know, two parties want to compute, right? So there's there's a, so x is the data, w is the weights, right? And we jointly want to compute the output, right? I want to classify a particular data using data point using a particular model, but neither the user nor the service provider wants to learn each other's input. So we want to figure out the output of the class uh, without learning each other's input, or without knowing anything about each other's inputs beyond the class label. Okay, and uh, by the way, I'm, I, this first time I'm giving this talk, so I don't know how fast or slow I'm going. So if uh, if I'm going either fa too fast or too slow, please uh, let me know and ask questions. Anyway, so um, so that's the goal. So I, I want to compute the output and only the output, not nothing. I want I don't want to know anything else about the, each other's um, parameters. And who wants to compute the output? Just the user, or does it not matter? Uh, actually, that doesn't matter. So both in the okay. end, both of them will be able to do this, but. Uh, um, so both the user and the uh, service provider will be able to do this. So how do we achieve this kind of uh, uh, solution? And again, this is a very fundamental problem. I mean, it's not. I mean, I, I'll talk about this in the context of deep learning, but you can imagine why this is important in any application beyond deep learning. Okay. So, uh, so this talk uh, basically do three things. So, so one, uh, you know, I'll give a brief primer on what's called secure multi-party com uh, computation or MPC. And this is, uh, you know, I know that there are security folks in the audience. So if you are a security person, you probably already know this, and this might be just a recap of what you already know. If you're not, then uh, I'm excited to share this with you because I learned about this very recently. Uh, and also I'll describe why MPC as it stands today is sort of inefficient in the context of deep learning. Uh, some fundamental reasons why that's the case. And uh, once we dis once we learn about that, uh, we will uh, talk about ways to design new families of deep neural networks, which are uh, particularly efficient for uh, you know, private inference of this form. And finally, I'll uh, wind up with some real world uh, examples of how this is used in practice. Okay, so let's begin. Um, so as again before, uh, we'll uh, call this problem uh, secure inference. Right? So so X is data, W are the weights, and I want to compute the action of the weights on the data and, and Y without learn without any further exchange of information. You know, um, no, so the user should not learn anything about the server's weights and the server should not learn anything more about the user's data. So this of course is, uh, you know, has been studied for a long time. This kind of problem has been studied for a long time and um, uh, in the applied crypto area, right? So it's, it's, in this particular case, there are two parties, right? But you could generalize this to more than two. So, the, uh, so it's called multi-party communication. So we will focus on two-party communication in today's talk. Um, but so we'll also um, assume a basic threat model because crypto people they function, and so the algorithms that we propose are uh, uh, you know, they vary depending on what assumptions you can make about the user and the server. So in this uh, work, we'll assume that the Parties are honest but curious, meaning that both parties follow the protocol that we'll describe. So they, they don't break away from the protocol and do arbitrary things. They will follow the protocol, but then within the protocol, you know, the parties can do whatever they want. They can 
employ whatever computational tools that they have at their disposal to learn as much as possible about the other person's information. So that's the honest but curious model. So that's the problem with study. And actually this entire field has been around for a long time. Um, just a quick um, glossary of terms we will encounter. Um, so it goes back to at least Yao in the 80s. Um, it's called the millionaire's problem. Um, and uh, you know it's a very evocative example. Right? So if you have Alice and Bob who have you know, X dollars and Y dollars, right? Um, I, both Alice and Bob want to know who's richer, right? But they don't. So I want to know who's whether Alice is. If I'm Alice, I want to know whether Bob's richer than me or not. But Bob doesn't want to give their um, wealth as a number, right? So in the end, I don't necessarily learn why, right? But I want to know whether Y is bigger than X or not. So, so that's the background, and you know, there are solutions to solve this kind of problem, right? So, in this case, for example, you know the function that you are trying to compute, the f of uh, you know, so f of x y is max of x y, right? And there are protocols which help you compute this without revealing x or y, right? So, in the end, both parties will know what f is, with, uh, you know, without knowing anything about x or or y. Uh, and the implementation is uh, of this particular um, secure uh, function computation is via what's called garbled circuits. Uh, we'll talk about garbled circuits later again. Um, more um, recently, I mean, it's evolved over the years. Um, in the last five to 10 years, uh, something called linear homomorphic, uh, homomorphic encryption has taken off um, and further variations, something called fully homomorphic encryption. And there it's something similar. It's, so it's the addition operation. So if you have X and Y and uh, you know, want to compute, um, so so the, so basically it, it boils down to finding encryption functions E, which are closed under addition and multiplication. And so if you can do that, then you can compute a large family of um, other functions. Um, another um, technique that's used in this, uh, Area is called additive secret sharing. So there, the, the idea is that you have a particular secret value x, but uh, there are two parties, and each party keeps shares of x. Right? So the, neither, so you don't really know the full x, but you know only part of it, and you compute bits and pieces as we go along. So, so anyway, these are just a, just a, I won't have time to go into details about this, and it's probably not necessary. But just uh, these are keywords which will come up again. So I just want to share this. Anyway. So, uh, so what we'll do is we'll try to use these ideas in deep learning. So, what do what what are we interested in? So again, we're interested in evaluating functions of the form f of x w, where now f is a deep network. Okay. So we have seen deep network. I'm, I'm assuming that everybody has seen deep networks before. This network is this picture is a deep network. It's a deep residual network because there are residual connections between layers. Right. So each box is one layer. Right. Um, so like a classifier, so this is, I don't know, I think this is the 18 layers here, this is a set 18, which is a deep image classifier. So uh, what we'll do in this talk is focus on uh, deep networks, which have basically linear layers and ReLU layers, right? So that's exclusively what we'll focus on. Of course, deep networks have other layers too, like for instance, we talk about transformers and things like that, there are other things like attention and stuff like that. Uh, we will not, have uh, we, won't, we won't cover that class of networks. Right? So only, only simple networks of the form linear, linear function, linear transformation followed by ReLU followed by linear and so on. Okay, so that's what we'll do. So uh, here's the so, so briefly talk about how this works. And this is not my work, by the way. Right? So this is um, I, I talk about uh, different protocols of doing this. Right. Uh, so eva eva evaluating this function securely. This has been around for like the last two, three years. I mean, people have come up with good protocols to, um, to do this kind of inference. Uh, the, but they all do the same thing. So I'll just talk about a, one like, particular example called Delphi, which was introduced in 2020. So here's how it works, right? So, uh, so imagine that uh, the deep network is some composition of these layers, like linear followed by ReLU and so on. So the uh, secure computation of this deep, uh, the function implemented by the deep network has the following stages, right? So there's a pre-processing phase 
uh, and this is how it works and it's kind of interesting that you can actually do this so uh, before anything happens right? so before even the input is given or uh, in the, you take the picture on your phone like as soon as you download uh, the app you know there's some pre-processing which happens right so here's what happens so the client and the server pick random vectors let's call it r and s right and uh, there's one such pair for each layer in the network okay so the client um, encrypts its uh, random vector sends to the server right and uh, the server multiplies uh, so multiplies r, r is the encryption right so because you can do homomorphic encryption you can do this multiplication in the encrypted domain right so you can multiply w times r in the encrypted domain subtract s and then send back to the uh, user and then the user decrypts so the user has this quantity on the at the bottom in the right right so this you can do using homomorphic encryption okay so this is done before even the input shows up okay. so let's keep this quantity the bucket in the back of our minds so now what happens so let's say that i want to now classify a particular image using our deep network model so uh, i'll focus on the linear part first okay so mentally let's just remove the non-linearities so just the linear part so let's say that i want to compute this linear function securely so the idea is that we will have we'll do this by secret sharing right so essentially both parties will have a share of the output at every layer okay so so here's again what we'll do so we'll uh, repeat this for each layer so in the first layer you know the client has the client holds R1. So I have defined as R1 through RL before, right? So the client holds R1 and then sends X minus R1. X is the input. The client holds the image, right? So the client sends X minus R1 to the server. Now the client and the server have two shares of, of, of the input, right? So I'll claim that in every uh, layer, this shared, this invariance of holding shares holds, right? So how does that work? So let's say that at some layer the client has rl and the server has x minus rl okay so all that's all the server needs to do is matrix multiplication which it can it has it has the weights so it can do matrix multiplication and once it does matrix multiplication you know you just have w times so the server has x minus r so you just do w times x minus r plus s right so the server has this quantity but the client has already you know in the, pre, in the previous slide we defined we did this uh, exchange where the client now has W times R minus S, right? So essentially the sum of these is really the output W times X, right? So, so what have we done? Well, we started with two shares of the input and then we did a very simple calculation, just a matrix multiplication to show that we have two shares of the output. So the invariance is maintained, right? So now you can imagine repeating this for several layers. So at each layer, you know, you have the client and the server have shares. And neither knows anything about the other share. Right? So you, can, you cannot really. So knowing knowing only W times R minus S does not tell you anything about W. Right? That's not. And similarly, knowing X minus R doesn't tell you anything about X because R is random. Right? We don't know any. We don't know either. Anyway, so this this is for the linear layer. So the linear layer is. Can be so linear layers can be securely computed you know, with no information exchange via this process of um, additive secret sharing. So now uh, let's go back to our model. We mentally crossed out the values. So what happens if now we uh, we have to deal with values, right? So values are nonlinear act activation functions. Um, so now I work. Again, we have two shares. So the client has U and the server has Z minus U. So let's so say two shares of this input to the ReLU, right? But then uh, notice that ReLU is just, uh, you know, U plus max of two things, right? So we can rewrite the ReLU in this way. And we know that we can do max securely. Like this was, of course, this is Yao's work from the 80s, right? So this is exactly the millionaire problem, right? So you want to find max of two things without ex knowing exactly what those are, or without one party knowing the other, what those are, right? So again, we can just apply this coordinate wise, so we can do a garbled circuit on each scalar coordinate wise, right? And I won't get into again the 
details of the garbage circuit. There's a fair amount of effort involved in actually implementing these garbage circuits. Actually, right? it's not it's not just a floating point computation. You have to do other things. Uh, anyway, so some complicated circuit involved here. Um, but finally, what you can do is you can compute this relu. So you, again, you'll have you have two shares of the output of the relu as well at the end of this operation, right? So just a quick recap, right? So recap, we can do this kind of uh, so main takeaway points of what I just discussed. This kind of deep network evaluation. You can first you have a high upfront pre-processing cost because you have this homomorphic encryption for each layer. But then notice that this is independent of the input. So therefore, if you have many such inputs, or if you take the pic, if you take pictures multiple times, then you can amortize this cost over multiple inputs. Right? So this this cost we will not really consider directly. Right? But what is really uh, I have a important question. here? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so this is an interactive protocol that uh, every layer there is interaction, right? And uh, for every value. Yeah, there is every there's it is an interactive protocol and there is uh so you will know the number, yeah. Yeah. So you'll know the number of layers in the network, for example. Yeah, so yeah, so what we we know the architecture. So F okay. yeah F is uh F is param like when you define F, you have to define the architecture. Right. Uh, so what is unknown to the user is just the weights. The, okay. Values yeah. of the weights. Yeah. Right, right. Of course, they probably know dimensions as well. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. is assumed to be known. That's right. Cool. Yeah, but, but uh, main main thing I want to say is uh, this: um, paper, if we set aside the pre-processing cost, the linear layers are actually as fast as the matrix multiplication. They, the server only had to do matrix multiplication. But the key that I want to point out is. The relus. The relus have garbled circuits. So every relu is a garbled circuit. And we know from Yao that garbled circuits are much, much slower. Right? So if you think about uh, relus as a floating point operation, it's just a single circuit. It's a scalar, it's a scalar operation, and we don't even think about relus when we talk about costs of deep networks. But here, the relu layers are the bottleneck. They, they cause about a two to four uh, order of magnitude slowdown. Right, so this uh, is actually kind of uh, interesting. Right? It's a different twist on how you think about neural networks. And again, you know, people have recognized this and have tried to make things faster. Right? So this is a, the relus are now the bottleneck. So what do you do to resolve this bottleneck? So on the crypto side, you know, there has been a sequence of improvements. People say, ah, okay, relu is a problem. Okay, let's do something else with relu. Right? We'll do a polynomial approximation and We'll do a noisy relu and we'll do you know, better, better garbled circuits, you know, all kinds of improvements on the crypto side. Uh, I won't get into the crypto part much, but what we'll talk about in this talk is on the architecture side. Right? So, so given a protocol, right, can we somehow think about better neural network designs? Right? So, so in fact, can we, sorry. Uh, can we design neural networks with as few ReLUs as possible? Right. So modulo a crypto protocol, uh, given, let's say fix Delphi as a crypto protocol, what's the best possible neural network architecture for that protocol? Or can, can we design something which has low cost under this protocol? Okay. So the re remainder of the talk is what I'll do. A quick aside about designing networks in general. Right? So again, this, so this is a field which has been studied for the last several years in the deep learning literature. And really there's, you know, sort of, I can count, I can count three different ways of designing networks. Right? So one is by hand, right? You just like write something down, right? Like into it uh, network. And this is what, you know, most practical state of the art networks look like. Just guess the architecture. Um, there's a field of uh, the body of work known as neural architecture search or NAS. Um, I'll talk about NAS more in detail. A third uh, approach of design networks is what's called neural network pruning. I just want to emphasize that what we are doing is not neural network pruning. Right? So notice that 
I don't want to design networks with as few neurons as possible, right? Meaning that I don't want to cut weights in this network, right? Instead, I want to design neural networks with as few non-linearities as possible, which is a slightly different thing, right? So it's not necessary that I want to decrease the number of parameters in my model, which is what neural network pruning is mainly focused on, right? Instead, I want to keep the number of parameters as much as before, even more than before, maybe. But that's really not a concern. But I want to minimize the number of non-linearities in the network. Okay, so, so it may be tempting to think of it as a pruning problem, but really we're not doing pruning. So I just want to mention that. Okay, so here's a quick again a quick primer on what mass uh, methods have been doing. So essentially, mass is a an algorithmic approach for searching for good architectures. And very broadly, there are two flavors of mass. Right? So, so something called macro search, and there's something called micro search. And you know, again, I won't have time to get into all of these, but they, you know, they have an affinity for uh, acronyms. Right? So you can see lots of acronyms on the demanding with S or AS. Um, all different types of search methods. Um, maybe a maybe a picture here. So, so this the macro NAS essentially, you know, you have a big network and you're trying to, so you have subnet like edges from one layer to the other and you want to find the best sort of skip connections essentially. So uh, let's ignore macro search entirely because I want to talk about that. Um, we'll focus on what's called micro search. So if you, if you have seen networks uh, such as VGG and you know, Google Net and so on. So what is VGG? I mean, you may also see in the VGG 11 and VGG 18 and so on, right? So really what VGG 11 versus VGG 18 is, is that you have a, what's called a VGG cell, right? So it's a small network, and then you repeat that cell multiple times, right? So that's, uh, that's VGG 18, VGG, so ResNet 18, ResNet 34. It's like a small cell repeated several times. Right? So, uh, so what microsearch NAS does is, figure out that the architecture of that small cell, which can be repeatedly stacked. Up. Okay, so that's what, uh, that's the spirit of micro, um, micro search NAS. Um, again, I won't talk about too much, but really, you know, how it works is that you have sort of atomic operations, right? So you define first a bunch of atomic operations that you care about, like, you know, three by three convolution, five by five convolution, max pool, average pool, and so on. And that's how you have, you know, a bunch of input uh, nodes. You know, sort of, so you have a transformer feature map to another feature map, but you don't know which operation to use. Right? So you, want to, you don't know whether to use a pool or a convolution or something else or a skip. Right? So what you do is you define edges in all possible operations. And your search space is now this multi-graph of edges between nodes. And what you want to do is to pick a subgraph or a subset of these edges. Okay? So, so imagine you know you have all these options and you want to figure out which paths to keep and which to remove. So, so you're looking at a subgraph of this big multigraph. And the strategy you will use to search for this subgraph is you know, some kind of greedy procedure. You know, people have proposed a bunch of different things. Um, let's just think of I mean, a simple way to do it is just like some kind of gradient descent, right? So parameterize these different edges using different coefficients, let's say alpha, and you would do gradient descent over alpha, and pick the one that works. Again, just ima imagine some procedure which picks the subgraph and let's just assume it works. Okay. Okay. So uh, just a quick example, and these are the kinds of things you find. It's very interesting you know, what kind of pictures you get. In, in microsearch, there are sort of two types of cells which are finally produced, right? So uh, there are what are called normal cells, which maintain resolution, and there are what are called reduced cells, which decrease resolution. So in in ScanNet, for example, it's common to start with a big and high resolution image and successively decrease resolution. Right? So that's why you, you need sort of two types of cells which are discovered. Yeah. Okay, so what we'll do is uh, try to use these ideas for designing good architectures for our problem. So what a uh, you know, first attempt, uh, you know, if you just apply these techniques out of the box, right? Turns out that you can't really use the NAS cells that we discovered using uh, traditional methods because they give cells with far too many values. So here's some numbers. So, <clears throat> so 
again, these acronyms are not important, but these are two different ways of doing microsearch, like darts and PC darts. And as you can see, you know, these numbers in the first number here is the number of relus in the network, you know, millions of relus, right? Like literally millions of relus, 8 million relus. And uh, the second number here is the accuracy on CIFAR 100. So reasonably accurate, you know, predictions can be got at the cost of, you know, far too many values. So what can you do? Well, you can decrease the depth of the, of the network or the number of channels. You can do those kinds of, you know, tweaking. And but then if you decrease depth, you also decrease accuracy. So if you go down so to say 100K values or something like that, you are left with only 33% or 36% accuracy, which is far below what is expected in deep learning. Right. So, uh, and, and notice, and it's those calculations that my colleagues did, even if you have merely 100K value operations in a network, that already has 2.3 seconds of latency. So if you want to perform secure inference using 100K, a network with 100K values, that takes 2.3 seconds, right? Which is, I mean, if you've done these kinds of things, it's, it's you know, thousand X more, slower than you know, what you, know, you could do with normal plain text inference. So this is clearly not acceptable. So you need to do something else. And that's really the contribution of our work. So we call our framework Sphinx. It's a new type of mass method to design deep networks which have a limited ReLU budget. And uh, really the method consists of three parts. Uh, I'll very briefly talk about each of these. Um, so really, uh, it, it's some amount of system design has to go in to make things work. Um, so the three features of our approach are the you know, a new search space, a slightly better search strategy, and also some post-processing. So let me explain each of these very briefly. <clears throat> so the first uh, part is, uh, the first step in our framework is um, redefining the search space. Right? So if you remember again, we have to start with a set of atomic operations, right? And we constructed this multigraph of edges involving these operations and then subselected from that. So the problem with uh, these atomic operations are uh, each of them has many, like the too many relus in the search space itself. So for example, these convolutions, really, you know, we don't even think about it, right? So as soon as we define a convolution operation, we also immediately Back on a relu after it. Right? That's like every single network in the literature is. When you talk about con layers, there's a con and a relu. We don't, we don't, because relus are for free, so just throw them, throw them in. Right? So we have to remove them. We to be very careful about where the relus appear and where they don't. Um, interesting thing that we had to do was to also remove max pools. Again, in, in deep networks, you know, the idea of max pooling is very standard, right? And in, we didn't think of max pools as uh, you know important in our calculation, but again, really it comes down to the max operation, right? So even the relu, if you remember, really you know the cost was in the max, right? So we in our first ex set of experiments we got very good results, but uh, and we we managed to remove almost every single relu in our network, right? Um, but then found out that all the values have been replaced by max pools. Right? Like, so, the net, so the approach learned to replace one nonlinearity with the other. Anyway, so we had to be careful in removing max pools as well. And finally, there's some other post-processing that needed. Anyway, it's not, it's not interesting, but the message is that we had to be careful in how to define the search space. Uh, the second step in our framework is, um, yeah, not very interesting, but it's just um, some engineering tweaks to differentiable architecture search. So we use uh, as a as a core search strategy, we use what's called darts. It's basically a gradient based method for picking the best subgraph of this multigraph of edges. And we have to do some again parameter tweaking to make sure that the relu budget is satisfied. So you have to trade off between the depth and the number of channels and so on. Anyway, not interesting. Uh, so I'll just mention it here. Um, finally, what we also have to do is to figure out where to place these reduced cells. So again, like I said before, you have to decrease you know, in a standard convolutional network, you have to start with a high resolution image and then decrease the resolution of the feature map as we progress in depth. 
and now we can decrease this in different locations right so we can either keep a reduced cell at you know one third and two let's say we have two two reduced cells we can either place it at you know one third the depth and two third the depth or you can place both in the beginning or both at the end and so on so that turns out to be important when you are counting the number of relu operations so to do that uh, we use what's called the gumbel soft max trick so it's essentially a sort of combinatorial selection problem in this case right so there is, let's say you have two reduced cells and there are k layers and we have to the k choose two options as to how to place these cells well it's like a indicator function that we have to learn over k choose you know k choose two elements right and can't optimize over indicators so the standard way to do it is relax you know, for, you know do some kind of soft max approximation to the indicator function and then optimize over the soft max right um turns out that these soft maxes have like overflow issues in these mass type methods so instead of doing that we use what's called the gumbel soft max trick I, I, again i can explain this if people are interested but it's basically a way to approximate soft maxes without like dividing by you know large or small numbers uh, Anyway, uh, yeah, something called the Gumbel uh, Gumbel soft max trick to figure out where the reduced cells are placed. So that's the three steps of our framework. And what I'll do now is um, to show you how the, how they work. So I mean, that's they work. I mean, that's really the answer, right? So uh, the, the method that I just proposed it's called Sphinx. It uh, achieves the Pareto curve. So really, what I mean, these kinds of papers, you know, the important quantity is you know the accuracy versus latency trade-off. Right? So you could have higher accuracy, but you know you have to pay more relus, and therefore it's lower. On the other hand, you could have very few relus, but you you know lose accuracy, right? So you know your good methods basically are outer bounds or outer envelopes on this Pareto curve, or achieve the Pareto optimality in this. Uh, in this space, right? So our method does that almost. I mean, there are some methods which beat it at the very, very low relu limits, right? But mostly work both on Sephora time um, and ImageNet. So this is this was the first paper to report results on large data sets such as ImageNet. Um, yeah, and so what? Again, if if we see the x-axis in these um, plots. You know, you might, it's it's not fully satisfactory, right? The runtime is you know seconds. This is per image, by the way, right? So seconds per image. So if you want to get seventy five percent accuracy on Cipher hundred, which is really good, you have to do you have a latency of four seconds per image, right? If you want sub second latency, then your accuracy goes down to seventy sixty five ish, which is okay but not great, right? So we have a long way to go, and there is I think. A lot of engineering and you know science to be done in figuring out how to get sort of real time behavior for these kinds of. Problems. So do you do you think that uh, like optimizing number of relus goes so far, and then beyond that, maybe just have to figure out smarter ways of dealing with relus, maybe parallelly do stuff or something, right? Uh, or better crypto. Yeah. So do you know where, where what the breakdown is? Like how much can you achieve by? Yeah, I'll, 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 maybe in the two or th two or three, I'm about I have five more minutes, but I, uh, in two or three sides, I'll speculate a few things about those kinds of points. Yeah, yeah, that's a fantastic question. I don't know the answer. I don't think anybody knows the answer. It's the somewhat nice, somewhat uh, niche area. I would say. Anyway, maybe uh, I'll say a bit more about it. Uh, but anyway, these curves basically show that uh, uh, what I proposed just now actually is a good idea, and but there's work to be done. Um, very briefly, I want to talk about a real world use case. Right? So this is simulations, right? But uh, I, I recently, um, you know, uh, so I was part of a team which um, um, uh, which founded an institute, one of these AI institutes. Uh, this is the Institute for Resident Agriculture. And um, I, this is something again. I'm not an this is not an area of expertise of mine, but what I what I found out after talking to some of my colleagues is that um, one digital agriculture is huge. And people are using machine learning in agriculture quite a bit. Right? So these robots and 
these fields, right? They bound these robots and ask them to roam around and there's tons of data being gathered and collected and stored somewhere, right? And nobody knows what to do with this data, therefore they want to do machine learning. So, um, particularly useful in these, uh, what's called stress phenotyping. So if, you're, if you have a crop and it has a disease, you know, normally what, uh, uh, how do you find out whether you know, a crop has disease or not, you, you ask, you send a farmer and ask them to look at it, right? But now it's possible to get like high resolution digital data and classify what stress is being um, applied or what, what kind of phenotypes are being displayed by the crops. So, so this, this technology exists, but there's a big trust gap between the user and the service provider. Like, you know, the people who build these robots don't want to send their data to anywhere. It's just not, not in the habit of posting the data sets online, right? unlike say classical machine learning. Right? So, a huge bottleneck. So, uh, you know, techniques such as secular inference might help bridge that gap, right? So even if you don't want to share data, you don't want to maybe show pictures of your fields or maybe your proprietary information as, as to how you plant stuff, I don't know. But even then that's okay, you know, as long as, uh, you know, you have the guarantee that your data is not being revealed. Right? All you need to know is whether you did, you know, the plant that you have in your field has a you know, disease or not. So let me just, so we did, we repeated some of our, um, you know, um, network design experiments on these kinds of data sets. So here's a example of what we can do. So this is uh, again, type of stuff that people in agriculture are interested in, right? So you have these, it's like a nine class classification problem, right? So there, again, I don't, my eyes can't, don't really know what each of them are, but apparently, you know, experts in agronomy can look at these and immediately classify you know, whether it's healthy or whether there's this potassium deficiency or what have you. So these kinds of uh, data sets exist. We can do class, we can build classif classifiers on them. And now if you want to do secure inference using these kinds of classification models, um, again, you know, standard models are far too slow. Right? So if you want to get good accuracy, say 90% plus, then you have to spend sort of hundreds of seconds uh, to achieve good classification on these data sets. So if you want to get that to something more reasonable, like a second or two, then you have to do NAS or network design of the form that I discussed. Right? So my results currently are, and there's a lot of a lot of room for improvement here. Too. Um, some food for thought, right? So one one thing that we also discovered here is um, the nature of these networks that we discover, discover like these that we design are kind of funny in a few ways. So. Removing these values, so re reducing the latency actually does not seem to affect accuracy very much. Right? So, it, so it seems that there are lots of values in our networks which are kind of redundant. But then what it does affect is uh, things like saliency maps. Right? So there are these methods to visualize you know, which part of a particular image gives rise to which class and so on. The jury is out as to how useful these methods or how sensible these methods are, but let's assume that they are, you know, meaningful. Turns out that the networks we design are very different uh, in terms of their saliency behaviors than you know, what, what, what other networks have discovered. So I don't know what this tells us, um, but uh, this, yeah. So, so something to think about, like as we design, or as we depart from the standard way of constructing neural networks, you know, it seems that these auxiliary things that we take for granted actually don't hold it very much. So, yeah. Do you uh, do you have such results for regular ImageNet images that uh, that, you can maybe, I, I mean, that people can maybe relate to more? Yeah, I don't. That's a good question. I I'm, I I, can't, I don't. Oh, that's I don't fine. think we did yeah. those experiments. Yeah, but that's a good uh, point. Yeah. Uh, so if you if you see if you see the columns, the second and third columns, the features don't, be, don't seem to be localized. And it seems like you have saliency. So red is red to blue, right? So red means you're looking at those pixels, right? Uh, it seems that a larger part of the image is being looked at. I don't know what this tells us to be honest. I mean, first of all, uh, the saliency maps have their own issues. So whether or not they're doing something meaningful is a question for a different talk, I think. but. Yeah, certainly the case that they don't, yeah. they don't look at localized features. Yeah, it's in my uh, quick question. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. Vino here, um, Aditya has farmers today. We did some similar experiments in terms of like for pruning, the, the effect of pruning on uh, on uh, uh, accuracy and uh, saliency maps, decision boundary and uh, uh, feature embeddings, etc. So when you say it doesn't affect accuracy, uh, you mean top one? Um, are you are you also analyze like per image classification? Uh, top one, yeah. So these numbers are actually top one accuracy, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah this so, is something we've been thinking about. Like, <clears throat> yeah, we yeah, will. I'll, I'll follow up with you in, uh, offline. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm curious to know what others have found in this general problem too. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I have a question which is related to what Vinu and Aditya said. Is like, so maybe like after removing relus, we are getting accuracy number, a number which is close to the original set. But what about robustness, consistency, and other aspects of the model? Maybe the model is now are more unfair, or if the model is more like if perturb changes are done that it doesn't do as expected. So what about those aspects also? That's <laughs> that's a question, and I have no idea. That's a terrible question. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm sure that all of, all those problems, robustness, fairness, you know, in class imbalance, you know, behavior under class imbalance, everything's affected. Yeah. So all we are doing is trying to maintain best accuracy. That's the only metric that we are trying to optimize for. I mean, we're keeping like under a relative budget, what's the best test accuracy that we can get? Right. So that's the problem that we are trying to solve. But you're absolutely right that that's not the only thing that we should be caring about. Okay. Uh, another question. So by removing relu, in short, you are saying we are removing non-linearity. So are you trying to like make the model simpler, like any connection with like, like hypothesis, like since we have now reduced hypothesis space or simpler hypothesis space, the model will be general or something, anything on that. And lastly, also, why did you choose the name spins? Like, is there any logic behind it or? or oh, why sphinx? Okay, in, in reverse order, uh... Why Sphinx? Well, something called Delphi. So, you know, Sphinx, Delphi, oh, okay. stuff like that. Uh, and I forgot your previous two questions. Uh, like, about... So, you are reducing the non linear. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? Oh, reducing so the how is, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, let, me, let me, maybe, yeah, I'll go to my last slide and maybe speculate a little bit, right? So, anyway, this is the talk, right? So, I gave a primer on MPC and talked about our framework for network design for private inference and showed some results. Um, I mean, these are all excellent questions, right? So, so one, so maybe start with your, the answer to your question. So one interesting direction for me is uh, lower bounds, right? So we, we have, so what's the effect of removing values? Right? And is there a sort of natural limit beyond which you cannot remove any more values? It seems that that's the case, right? So if we, if we do want, you know, high performing image classifiers, then we cannot let our regions become too linear because if they do, then you know perform, I mean, we know that our class is not linearly separable. So, so there's some natural lower limit, and what's that? I think that's an interesting question to think about. Um, Aditya mentioned a few minutes ago, but what I think, yeah, I absolutely agree with you that really we should be doing some kind of core design, right? The crypto community has been thinking about optimizing protocols at the arithmetic level or the, at the the function computation or the simpler function function computation level. Um, NAS talks about networks as a whole, right? Uh, but some kind of core design, right? So marrying the crypto more tightly to the the choice of network. I think I, that's I think an interesting direction to think about. Um, yeah. I only talked about uh, training. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I talk, only talked about inference. It's a whole new ball game as to whether you want to do private training. Right? Uh, this things just like. Go out to the window, right? Already, just for one single inference, you have, it takes seconds. If you want to do private training, that's uh, so almost impossible using today's tools. So that's a major challenge still remaining. And uh, also, I didn't talk about. Uh, I only talked about linear ReLU networks, right? Um, but you know, things like transformers and VITs and language models and so on is all completely open. So yeah, that's a bunch of different, and I think, uh, to me, very interesting directions and the fertile area for work, you know, I, I think. Uh, but yeah, just end with some references to some of my papers and yeah, maybe stop here and happy to chat for as long as you guys want. Yeah, so uh, let's uh, let's thank Chinmay and uh, 
Yeah, and I have to go, Chinmay. I will catch up with you afterwards. I will, I've made Jeff the host, and uh, I'm sure people have questions which uh, they will ask now. Of course, yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, yeah, so great. So thanks a lot for the talk. I especially enjoyed how the, um, you, you know, <laughs> like a lot of these, I'd heard of these main things, but you kind of overviewed these, you know, these areas very nicely. Um, all right, so I've got a couple of questions, but anyone from the audience uh, want to ask a question first? Um, I have a question. Sure, um, sure, go ahead. Dina. But you might get some echo because you have other students in the lab listening to the talk without headphones. Uh, so far, so good. So feel free to good. go ahead. Okay. You know, one from a practical use case, um, but when we have these pre-trained model for certain tasks, um, I, I, I've been thinking if, like, if we want to be able, if if there are methods where we can switch from uh, plain text inference into private inference, um, instead of searching for a new, because a lot of the ton of work gets into you know designing these networks by hand and optimizing the underlying software stack for inference on a particular device, so. One problem we've been thinking of, how can we, uh, given a particular neural, neural architecture with a certain number of uh, max poles or values and cons, is there, a, is there a way, a systematic way where we can make it more efficient for private inference? And this is in a pure FHG setting, but uh, I'm not familiar with the secure MPC setting. Uh, do you think that's yeah. like a... I think that's super interesting, yeah. So we, we thought about FHG and the community has also thought about FHG. Right? And from, I'm not a crypto expert, but from what I understand, FHG is several orders of magnitude slower than say, secret sharing, right? Like, um, mm -hmm. so this idea of amortizing, you know, pre-processing to amortize costs and then you know, do something much simpler, that seems to be more compelling. Uh, but yeah, we have, I would like to understand more you know, whether there are alternatives like FHA. Um, uh, yeah. And as to the question of how to optimize uh, for a particular architecture, uh, yeah, that's again also. So, yeah, I'm not aware of people who actually thought about that carefully, but that's an interesting direction too. So I'm giving vague answers. I don't know exactly the answers to this. Yeah, so great. So maybe I'll ask a question. Oh, um, um, so Bay, do you want to go ahead first? Uh, yeah, thank you. So, uh, so very nice talk. Um, I'm very curious going back to the uh, saliency maps that uh, if you don't mind going to that slide. Um, when you say that your conjecture is that uh, for, your, for your system, which is second and third column, um, it, it feels like the, 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 the high signal is coming from this red region and are you considering that as a local versus a global feature? I think this is a part I'm a little bit uh, unclear to me because if I were just thinking about areas, right? It's it's really just central to this uh, this image that there's really a huge area that your model is actually sort of highlighting versus ResNet, uh, where like you know like in terms of like areas, it's actually a much smaller area. So I was I'm hoping that if you could like say a little bit more about how you kind of describe those patterns, whether are they are really local um, patterns or they are really more of a global pattern. Like what do you think about those saliency map really mean? Okay, uh, so it was a good question. Uh, first of all, I'll say something general about saliency maps, right? So I never really, I don't know how to interpret them uh, beyond the specific examples here. Right? I, I really don't know what to make of saliency maps at all, like there are these very evocative examples of dogs and cats. And if you want a dog class, then you, the, the red pixels are on the dog and the cat class in the red. But uh, the beyond that particular dog cat example, you know, if you change it to like a violin and a guitar, you know, suddenly the same algorithm stops working, right? So, so I'm a bit, I'm a bit skeptical of the whole idea of using you know, gradient-based saliency. But let's assume that that is reasonable. So mm -hmm. modulo correctness of the RADCAM method for computing saliency. What this is, what this set of pictures is telling us is that a larger, so given given the network that we designed, the Sphinx network, 
versus say a ResNet 18, a larger proportion of the input pixels are contributing to the particular class or, or the final class table, right? A much larger proportion of the pixels. Whereas in say ResNet 18, it seems that that's not the case, right? Like, um, you know, the, the smaller subset of pixels, or, or at least if you weight pixels by relative import, again, I don't know, the word importance is not the same as I think what GradCam is producing, right? But relative to our network, you know, ResNet 18 uses a smaller subset of pixels to decide a particular class. So that's the interpretation of these um, these pictures. So that I, I, I'm not 100 percent sure what this what that tells us about. Uh, I mean, this may this might tell us something about how standard networks are designed, right? Because this is saying that there are two different networks which roughly get the same accuracy, but which give widely different saliency maps. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? I mean, which one is correct? I'm, I'm not sure, right? Like, I'm not sure which one is the right saliency map, right? It seems that in, in the whole saliency literature, people look at it and somehow reverse engineer the, the intuition. But yeah. this example really does, does not match that at all, I think, yeah. Just to add- I, I hope that answered your question. I'm not sure if you did. Yeah, I I know like seeing the same has its own issues, but um, I guess I guess um, Vivek, you have a comments, right? I was just saying like, can human do that? Like for example, if I give to expert, and then ask them what why this is classified at this, and they mark like the reason, like this like like the human explanations or human evidence for classification kind of thing, and then that if the model highlight the same thing, then maybe you can say like the same. I, I guess I guess what that what that I mean that 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 can be a typical problem for some of those visualization approaches is that uh, once you create the saliency map you kind of move you kind of kind of transfer the interpretability of the machine learning model itself to the interpretability of the visualization itself, uh, which having a visualization does not naturally imply interpretability. Uh, I think this this visualization only shows the differences that you know those model give different. Uh, saliency maps, but I don't know if there is a direct sort of causality between sort of the distribution of the saliency map versus e efficiency of the model itself. Right. I agree. I uh, totally agree. At the very least, this is saying that there exist two very dramatically different families of networks with completely different saliency maps, which perform well. Yeah. Right. So now, which what does that tell us about standard deep networks? I'm not sure. Maybe maybe there is a totally third different family of networks which do correspond to human intuition, and we just haven't discovered that yet. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks for your comments. <laughs> um, um, so great. So maybe I'll ask one more question. Uh, we're kind of at the end of our time, so I I would ask you about kind of if, you, if you're thinking more kind of mathematically about what is removing all of these so Ray Lu is doing like. If you think you have like a fully connected network, you start with and you prune out all the ReLUs on one layer, then the, you've kind of lost the effect of that layer because you're just doing two matrix multiplies, right? Um, but if, if you do something as simple as like insert one ReLU at, at some point on the boundary between the layers, does that add a large amount of, of nonlinearity? Or, you know, is at some point you could do something like say, put I can put five ReLUs on each layer. Is this giving you enough memory or, or not? If people thought about, because people have thought about the geometry of what, you know, just a two layer fully connected thing with ReLUs in it does. People thought about if you allow just a, a handful of ReLUs inside what, what the ge geometry of the nonlinearity looks like. And Yeah, fantastic question. Um... We have some I how to say ideas as to how to answer that, and but uh, maybe in a few months' time I'll have a better answer for you. But I mean that goes back to our um, the last point here on lower bounds. Right? So so at least in the case of shallow networks, uh, I mean people have studied these. I mean there are these uh, results on expressivity of net of networks with very low activations and other types of activations too. And, and you can measure expressivity in different ways. So you can talk about 
memorization capacity you can talk about ability to approximate a you know smooth function and so on and how many how many neurons do you need to do this right so there I mean, this goes back to the classical universal approximation results but also modern results which talk about depth and um, yeah so they're both upper and lower bounds and and yeah i fully agree i mean the natural question to ask would be you know if we revisit those results in the light of now a relu budget so so can i say you know if i only let half the relus or half the neurons in this network have a non linearity how does that affect the expressivity and the capacity and i think that's a very natural direction yeah um yeah that's at the at the, at the moment i can that's all i have to say about that yeah, yeah. So great. So we can we can uh, I'll leave it there on, on another open question. Um, so thanks a lot for coming and for the the really interesting talk. Um, okay. Yeah. Th th thank yeah. you. And yeah. So thanks again. Thanks so much. Yeah. Take care. Yep. Bye bye. Bye.